Don't be shocked when young people begin to embrace these leftist causes and leftist ideas. Don't be shocked when they begin to voice confusion about their own masculinity, about their own femininity, when they begin to voice confusion about their own sexuality, when they begin to embrace leftist causes and agendas. Before you start criticizing millennials and Gen Zers, you need to recognize that there has been a conspiracy against them, against these generations. On this particular episode, what I want to do is focus on your questions and comments. We've done this before and it allows us to hit a wide variety of subjects, but it seems like it's the right thing to do in this time of year when so many people are on vacation and uh, indeed so many of the ideas have consequences. Staff are spread far and wide enjoying their families and friends. Now, where I want to start today is with Gen Z and millennials. Now, we discussed Gen Z and millennials in a previous podcast, and I got a lot of questions and comments from the posse, and I, uh, I'll i read a few of those, but let, let me start a, a little more broadly as I address this particular issue, because there were a few things that I said in that podcast that I would have liked to have expanded upon, and I'm going to do that just a little bit right here right now. Let me offer first some advice to older generations. I'm a member of um, Gen X. Uh, I don't know what the generation is. You have baby boomers uh, and so on. And uh, and it is the, the practice, I think, of those generations that are older than Gen Z and millennials to complain about them vociferously and to criticize them. And, you know, um, I can fall into that. Uh, I think we all can. It's very easy to do. Um, but I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to actually convert anyone. I don't think it's particularly helpful to anyone. And I think it's also kind of punting on what the broader issues and problems are because I think we have to recognize that there has been a conspiracy against Gen Z and against millennials. And that conspiracy has been wrought uh, largely by baby boomers, but certainly there are members of my own generation who have been in on the conspiracy as well. And that is a conspiracy in education, in entertainment, in industry, and in government. I mean, it's like the whole culture has been against them. So if some among them are more than just a little confused, that's why. That's the reason why. They've not been taught, many of them, some have. They've not been taught a proper view of masculinity. They've not been taught a proper view of femininity, the complementary roles of men and women, um, responsibility, um, a a strong work ethic, not even an accurate understanding of their own history. So when we look at these generations, when we see some of the things that are happening, for instance, in uh, you know sexually and otherwise, uh, it's easy to just simply say, you know, that they're just messed up. Well, who is it that messed them up? How did they get there? Well, that has been their teachers, that has been their government. That has been the, uh, the, the, the source of their entertainment. And I have to lay the responsibility chiefly at the role of parents. And that is because parents are to be the strongest influence in their child's life. Listen, as a, uh, as a parent of four grown adult children, all married, uh, all successful, all thriving, and all of whom uh, are Christians, they're not perfect, uh, certainly, uh, certainly flawed individuals, but people who are thriving. We made some very hard decisions when our children were younger. Now, our oldest was born in 1988, and so he is he falls into the millennial crowd. Our youngest fall into the Gen Z crowd, but they share a lot of common characteristics. And some of the things that we realized even then when our oldest was just first entering 
into um, that area you know, of life where you're trying to make decisions about whether or not he goes to a public school or a private school or you home, you know, what are you gonna do in that regard? We made the very difficult decision to homeschool our children and we homeschooled all of them. Uh, our oldest, Michael, he went for a time to a private preparatory school where, uh, where I actually um, was teaching history and philosophy and Russian literature, eventually dean of students, which is like being the angel of death um, in, a, uh, in an institution like that. Thus, I could have some influence over what teachers he did and didn't have, and I could keep you know really kind of a close eye on him. But we made that decision at a time when, again, this is the early 90s, when it felt <laughs> homeschooling was not mainstream. It felt, it felt you know, Branch Davidian. You know, it, was, it, it was almost like we were you know, joining some kind of cult. Uh, but we were willing to suffer the criticisms of our peers, of our friends, Christian friends, conservative friends, who just thought, man, that's just weird that you would make the decision for your children to be homeschooled. And I must tell you, that often people, our friends, would take that very personally because it's as though they are um, receiving, they're interpreting your decision to homeschool your children as though you're better than they are, that you're condemning their own decisions with their own children. We were doing nothing um, of the kind. It's just that I recognize that as a man, as a husband, and as a father, I have to give answer um, for my own family not for someone else's choices, not for their own children, not for their own parenting, but for mine. And, uh, and I'm, I'm reminded of a passage in Scripture in Deuteronomy where the Lord says this of Eli. It says, his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. And it's the, the Lord says there that he judged Eli because of this, because he did not discipline his children. He didn't, he didn't raise them up, um, nurture and admonition of the Lord. He just, he just simply didn't do this. And the result of this was, was judgment upon his own household. Uh, as I said in the, uh, the previous episode of this show, or, or one of the previous episodes of this show, I am not saying that if you have wayward children that it is your fault, parents. I am not saying that. Uh, as I said then, and I was really, I should give proper attribution, this is actually a comment made by Charles Swindoll, who made the observation that God, who is the perfect father, has the most wayward children. And that, of course, is very true, meaning sin nature is real. It's real enough that we don't really need outside influences or forces to make bad choices. Uh, Jesus even had in his midst um, a Judas. You know, here he was a perfect teacher. A, uh, a perfect rabbi, a perfect man, modeling for the disciples what they should be. And yet Judas turned against him. So, you know, this can happen. Uh, it is a reality. That said, I don't want to let parents off the hook either. There is a lot of bad parenting that is going on these days. Parents that are not willing to discipline their children, they're not willing to rebuke their children, they're not willing to train their children. Parenting is hard work. You have to make a commitment to be involved in the lives of your children. You have to make, and by the way, here I am You know, now at 56 years old, again, my children grown. I would say to you that I have learned as my children have grown into adulthood, Lori and I have discovered that parenting doesn't end. It doesn't end. I was just giving my son Zachary some fashion advice, which he, which he needed. So uh, I, uh, I will say that the, the, um, the, the parenting truly doesn't end. Now, it does change. My role has changed. I don't have authority over their, their lives. I'm playing now more of the role of an advisor and a coach and you know someone who can facilitate things on their behalf. I enjoy, as a parent, being able to open doors from them for um, from time to time, um, but I'm parenting nonetheless, and it's because there's a certain wisdom that was handed down to me from my own parents and grandparents and older adults when I began parenting, 
um, to uh, the kind of things that I can do for them now. And so that matters. But again, bear in mind, before you start criticizing millennials and Gen Zers, and I, by the way, I don't want to sound like I'm just, I'm just condemning you know, the, the whole of these generations because I absolutely am not. But you need to recognize that there has been a conspiracy against them. And if you are a parent that has not been fulfilling your responsibilities to your children, then you're part of the conspiracy against these generations. You know, it's interesting to me, as I think on this, that the church has often been in on the conspiracy uh, I take this tweet by William Wolf. I don't know William Wolf personally. We follow each other um, on Twitter, and so I, I do see his tweets. And this one struck me as quite interesting. It is a photo of the milk toast Christianity Today staff. And this is what Wolf says. He says, the staff of Christianity Today magazine, the once venerable Christian publication founded by Carl F.H. Henry, this picture is just begging for an eight-part podcast series, The Rise and Fall of Christianity Today. Let's make that happen. Now, um, I, I want to assure you that eight-part series will not be on Ideas Have Consequences. I have no interest in doing that. I, 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 think, I'd, I think I'd be ready to put a gun in my mouth by the end of, um, of such a series. That said, the picture itself is quite interesting. At the very middle, you see Russell Moore, and um, this is these are these are almost in all women, and those people in the picture here who are not women are effeminate and left leaning, which is usually the same thing. It's usually the the same thing. Now I took some flack because I tweeted that I said that very thing when I. When I, uh, when I saw this uh, tweet, I retweeted it and added my own comments um, that here we are, we're, we're looking at, as I say, um, the effeminate staff of Christianity Today. And there were some people who responded to that by saying, you know, you need to apologize. Gosh, I really appreciate your work, Larry, but you really need to apologize for saying something like that. I don't see any people here who are dressed like women. Well, that isn't actually getting at my point. My point wasn't about their, um, their style of dress. Uh, it had nothing to do with that. They, they, they could have been uh, all dressed here as the Marlboro Man, and I would have made the same, the same comment. Rather, what I'm getting at is that if you know anything about Christianity today, you know that it has become essentially, and, and by the way, this was once, as he said, a venerable magazine that uh, put forward a strong case for the gospel and commentary on biblical uh, and Christian issues. Not anymore. The, the magazine has become, like the Gospel Coalition, it has become essentially an arm of the Democratic Party. And Megan Basham, who writes for Daily Wire, she did some excellent reporting on this issue, and she said this uh, in a tweet on this same picture. Between 2015 and 2022, Christianity Today magazine staff members made 73 political donations, all to Democrats. This includes the CEO and editorial staff, news editor Daniel uh, uh, Silliman, uh, in particular, gave to five different Democrats, including Senator Elizabeth Warren. Now, this is where we are. So when we're talking about the conspiracy, and it is, by the way, a conspiracy against uh, millennials and Gen Z, and Gen Z most of all, where's the church? The, this, is, this has been a pillar of Christian publications. This isn't just simply on the fringe of the, the Christian faith. This is, you know, in the mainstream right here, but it doesn't represent um, authentic Christianity, biblical Christianity anymore. So when, when the people in your pulpits, when the commentary on the Christian faith is the kind of stuff that they're putting out, don't be shocked when... Uh, a children, when young people begin to embrace these leftist causes and leftist 
ideas. Don't be shocked when they begin to voice confusion about their own masculinity, about their own femininity, when they begin to voice confusion about their own sexuality, when they begin to embrace uh, a various um, uh, leftist causes and agendas. That's what's going on here. When I think about these generations, I realize that they are longing for role models and lacking good ones. They latch on to buffoons like Andrew Tate, who is a misogynist and pseudo-Muslim, who is the very embodiment of toxic masculinity. And, a, and again, a guy like Tate, he says some good things every now and then, which draws you in, and then he turns right around and he's pimping out women or you know, laying out um, his, uh, his inaccurate views of what Islam actually is. He doesn't understand the very religion that he says that he espouses, but this is where we are. And why are millennials and Gen Zers latching on to people like this? Because they're not finding them in the church. They're not finding them. And we have to make sure that we begin to put forward those role models. Again, parents, <laughs> you're not perfect. You'll never be. Um, you're fallen. You are sinful. Um, but you're trying to point them to Jesus Christ. You're trying to point them to the cross. And, um, and you make your, your faith real and sincere uh, when not only are you living it, but when you do fail, you repent and you move forward. That, there's, there's models both in success and in failure, and they're not seeing that in the culture. So you ask me, what can you do? Well, you can begin to mentor generations like this. Um, but again, as I say, they're not, they don't all fall into this, this category. Here's a little interview that I did over the Christmas break with my son, Zachary. Zachary is uh, sort of on that, that, that border between millennials and Gen Zers. I say that he's a, you know, he's a Gen Zer in his twenties. And this is him with his new bride, um, Nikki. So I just sat down with him. There's nothing pre-planned in this conversation, but you get some idea of their viewpoints. I'm sitting here on this uh, fine day with my son, Zachary, a Gen Zer, and with his new bride, my new daughter-in-law, Nikki. So what do you two perceive to be the real issues with your generation? Um, I think it's the first two that come to mind are pretty closely related, and it's um, one, I think it's just education because a lot of people in my generation, they have no real appreciation for history or, you know, the history of what they've come from and no real knowledge about the world that they live in. And the result of that, which is the second issue is that, uh, in the absence of any real challenges in their lives, they inflate everything that's to a level of drama that it doesn't deserve. So big nothings become, you know, all consuming and it creates a culture of victimhood that is just, I think, consuming my entire generation on stupid things and inflating problems that aren't real problems because they have no real appreciation from where they've come from and what this country even is on you know, a, a global scale and how privileged they actually are. What yeah. do you think? I think that victimhood mentality just keeps people from facing like the reality of situations around them as well. Like They're just constantly self-focused. Like, I have so many problems and they can't you know, take big issues and really look at them from a broader perspective because it's such a self-focused perspective of life. Where do you think the victim mentality comes from? Drinking champagne all day? Or uh, that's where right, do you think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, kind of like what Zach was saying, honestly, it's just like a lack of actual issues because we are so privileged, especially, you know, in America and many uh, people our age have grown up in wonderful homes. They have you know, gone to college or they have had certain opportunities that maybe people in other countries wouldn't have. And so they don't have like, you know, um, necessarily these huge issues in their life. That's not to say they don't trace, like face troubles and things like that, but they just take like little things. And if they, um, if they can't find a big problem, they just make little things a huge issue and, and they don't recognize the reality of their situation. Have you found that travel has been helpful? You both returned mm -hmm. from a, from a honeymoon and you, you didn't go to a third world country, but mm -hmm. do you, um, do you find that travel has been helpful in giving you that perspective? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I think actually travel is maybe the most important thing that 
um, our generation needs and doesn't really have. And it's because it does give you perspective. Because I have a lot of, I know a lot mm -hmm. of people, people I went to college with who would be like, America is the worst country. America mm -hmm. sucks. America needs to be more like all these other countries. But what becomes clear is they don't know anything about those other countries. They've yeah. never <laughs> been to them. And so they're comparing the U. they act like the U.S. sucks, but they've never been anywhere or seen anything else because... <laughs> if they had, they would, uh, they'd feel very differently about where they live. Yeah, because when you go to places, um, and you talk about this a lot, you get like the travel fallacy, right? You get this great perspective of, um, you know, Paris or Rome or whatever, because you get to stay in the, a great location when you're there. Yeah. But the what reality I call the traveler's fallacy. Right, yeah. the reality of that is, is that the people that actually live their lives there are living in more socialist type countries. And you see, and you see these really bland apartments and everyone drives the same car and it's like no one can move up in society, right? You can't work your way to the top because seemingly that they, they don't want you to. So um, I think America is a great country and I think that our generation has lost some perspective on that. Now, as I said, that's just a, um, you know, a very extemporized interview with the two of them um, during this Christmas um, holiday. And, uh, and I was just curious to get their view because we've been discussing their generations in particular. Now, I didn't coach them about what they were or weren't going to say in response to my questions. They didn't really know what my questions were were going to be in advance. Now, obviously, Zachary, as my son, grew up under my teaching and my thinking, and I had some role in shaping his worldview, thank God. Um, we didn't just hand our children over um, to, be, uh, to be educated um, by the pagans in public schools. But I wanted to play that for you because I wanted you to be aware that there are plenty of sensible people within these generations. They're aware of what is, is going on. They know, in some cases better than we do, what is actually happening. And I thought it was interesting that they focus on the victim mentality. Uh, they recognize that among their own generations, there are those who are of this mentality and it's because they've been coached into believing it. They've been coached into believing that they are victims. This is, this is what intersectionality, which is a Marxist tactic that we've discussed in previous episodes, is all about. It's about turning every cultural subgroup against each other. Women against men. Black people against white people. White people um, against black people. Uh, Hispanics against white people and black people. Immigrants against citizens. Americans against the world. And vice versa, and so it goes on and on and on because it creates cultural, societal instability. That's what's going on there. And so they do recognize that these things are actually happening around them. I, now, I did think it was interesting when I asked them about travel, did they think the travel made any difference in their own perspectives, and both said they did. Now they've just come back from a uh, from a honeymoon abroad. They uh, they visited several European countries, and to be clear, they weren't uh, you know going in a Land Rover across the uh, the Sudan while the uh, you know um, Boko Haram was was um, hot on their tail. These kinds of things weren't uh, weren't actually happening. They were. They were hitting uh, uh, beautiful European capitals and doing the kinds of things that you would expect lovers to do on their honeymoon. Nonetheless, they're smart enough to recognize when they're you know getting in a you know in a boat and taking a dinner cruise down the Seine um, or shopping up and down the Champs Elysees in uh, in Paris. They're smart enough to recognize this isn't the way the rest of the world lives. That what they're seeing there isn't the reality of life for Parisians or for Frenchmen. It just isn't. Um, you know, uh, most Americans have never left the country. Data shows that only 31% of Americans have passports, which, which indicates that roughly that number have <laughs> been out of the country. That means that roughly 69% of Americans have never been abroad, have never been abroad. And as I say... Even among those who have, I would suggest to you that the vast majority of them have only 
you know, been on a fishing trip in Canada, got drunk in Tijuana, took a honeymoon cruise in the Caribbean, maybe went on a mission trip to Haiti or, you know, a student group, uh, a trip to, um, to London or Paris, meaning they haven't really tasted the world. They've, they've sampled it just a little bit, but they haven't really spent meaningful time abroad and certainly not in third world countries. And so the result of that is they don't know any better. And so when their educators, be them high school or college, are telling them and their media is telling them that America is an awful country, um, that it is racist, uh, that it is backward, that it needs to get uh, in step with the rest of the world, they're inclined to believe it because they don't know what the rest of the world is like. And that's why I wrote my book, Around the World, in more than 80 days, discovering what makes America great and why we must save it. I wrote that book because I wanted to introduce, during the pandemic, I went to roughly, I think, 35 countries um, writing articles for a variety of magazines as I did it and doing a number of radio shows while I did it. Uh, the book, I think, includes 26 countries because we didn't we didn't want to make it as thick as... Um, you know, it's my friend Paul Reed's book here, The Last Lion. But we did it. I did it because I wanted to try to educate these generations on what the rest of the world is like. And basically saying, before you burn this country to the ground, maybe you should know what the rest of the world is like. And so I hit every continent but Antarctica and... Um, those countries that the left would hold up to us as models, chiefly in Western Europe, Scandinavia, and offered some evaluation of those countries and an evaluation of the United States in comparison to those countries. Because again, there's colossal ignorance of this country, of its history, and of the rest of the world. And so if you, again, if you want to know what you can do, mentor these generations. Take an opportunity to engage them in coffee shops. Um, at your local church is really the best opportunity to do that. Um, volunteer to host um, groups in your home, student groups. Um, maybe you want to teach Sunday school. There's all kinds of things. Big brother, big sister programs, which these days, I was a part of that many years ago. Um, these days, you probably have to be a lefty to become a become a big brother, a big sister. But point is, there are plenty of opportunities and there's real longing uh, among these generations to find proper role models because they're not being provided with them. <clears throat> here's, another, here's, here's another comment right here that relates to this. And I'm going to read you this one. It's, it's a little bit lengthy, but because I think this woman, Bella, I think she nails it. And this is a, a comment that she made on uh, my YouTube channel. I truly believe this whole mess began by this mess. She's talking about um, sexual confusion. This whole mess began with the emergence of the women's liberation movement back in the 60s. I was a young girl back then, so I remember it quite vividly, the stark and radical change in language and behavior of a relatively small group of women. As it rolled out into the 80s, you could distinctively see two camps of people. There were those women who remained quite prim and proper and those who were burning their bras and going into construction jobs or those jobs traditionally held by men. I must admit I played on both sides of the aisle, entertaining the conventional and unconventional. I became a police officer, got on the SWAT team, and so on. It was fun. However, now, as a much older adult, I can see how that phenomenon actually affected men and masculinity generally. In hindsight, it felt so, uh, so misguided. The ideas were perverted to accord themselves to individual agendas. Instead of an attempt at equality, it became a chance to attack those who were the objects from which equality was being sought. Hence, the beating down of men to become more like women or to become more effeminate men. Now, this same group of women, though they have evolved, have preyed upon anyone who doesn't quite fit into their norms. This has led to such confusion with disastrous consequences. As a woman, I have always preferred manly men. 
living near a naval base, there was nothing more grand than seeing a man in uniform, seeing a businessman with a gentleman's haircut, a handsome suit, and leather-soled wingtip shoes is dreamy. My late husband was such a man, proper, confident, courageous, and a protector of women. I believe this is the way God designed us. We're all created equal, but we have distinct, unique, and beautiful roles to play. I pray for the confused, be charitable and loving, listen and guide. There is a way out of all this mess. God bless. God bless Bella. What a, what a tremendous insight that she's offering here. Now, she's responding in part to a video that we showed you of a young 20-something a woman, an influencer, who was talking about how uh, she found men of her grandfather's generation, and she says her grandfather was of the World War II generation. She finds them far more attractive when she's looking at photos of them. And of course, again, as I pointed out in that episode, what she's responding to is their dress because you know she's not interacted with them other than her than her grandfather. She's just responding to the photos. But what she sees in those photos are confident, masculine men. Uh, who are dressed professionally, who show respect for themselves and for others in the way they present themselves. And she finds that appealing. And again, I want to repeat this. I've offered advice for, for older generations. Now I want to offer it again for Gen Zers and millennials. If you want to set yourself apart, take care of your physical person. Invest in your physical person. Dress, as they say, for Success, but carry yourself with confidence. I don't mean with arrogance. I'm not talking about with a, sag, a swagger. I'm not talking Deion Sanders here. Rather, I'm simply talking about carrying yourself with a measure of confidence in who you are and what you're about. And if you don't know who you are and what you're about, then, 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 then you need to figure that out. You need to discover what that is. You know, Scripture says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Uh, it doesn't mean again that um, you know Andrew Tate to me is is the very picture of tos toxic masculinity, but so is on the other end of the spectrum what Christianity today is presenting. That's tox toxic masculinity as well because that's a feminine kind of Christianity. That's not that's not masculinity. That's 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 not a proper view. So don't think that masculinity means you. You need to behave like uh, you know some sort of you know brute that you might see on uh, on TV. Nor does it mean, however, that you're just simply you know milk toast. You have no clarity about who you are. You talk in uh, in uncertain terms. Uh, you carry yourself sheepishly. You speak sheepishly because you are sheep. Don't do that. Don't do that. And again, you see the way God has made us is to respond. As uh, um, here she is as a woman saying that she responds to a manly man, and hence she married one. The, the reverse is also true, ladies. Uh, most men are not looking for whores. They're not looking for masculine women. They're looking for women who are confident in their femininity and carry themselves that way. Women who carry themselves with a certain measure of modesty. Men are looking for that. Don't buy into to the things that you're seeing from the culture. As my mother said to me when I first started dating, she sat down with me to have a conversation. It was one of those kind of awkward, weird conversations you don't want to have with your parent, but you need to have. And she said to me, it was very simple. She said, there are two kinds of women, son. There are those that men like to date and those they like to marry. Choose the latter and that no other explanation was needed. I knew exactly what she was talking about and uh, and that's precisely what I did. So, um, you know, think on these things. Here's another comment, excellent one. I'm a child of the 1950s and 60s. As I came of age, I thought my parents and their friends looked older in their high school yearbooks than my classmates at the same age. I'm from, and by the way, I thought that too. I don't know if you've thought that, if that's been your experience, but I did think that. I'm from the first generation of hippies and the counterculture. We were taught, don't trust anyone over 30. That was the saying. These were the roots of today's permanent adolescence and androgyny. It's so refreshing to see today's young women longing for men like her grandfather's 
generation. It is so true. The nature of men and women haven't changed, even if the behavior has. If it's become perverse, again, it's because of the conspiracy in which I am talking about. And I think, by the way, what what is being said here is that sometimes those those older generations look older to us because of the way they dressed. They did dress. It was not uncommon for a young man to go to a high school or college you know, wearing a tie. You'd never see that today. But that was a, that was a common thing. Zachary uh, making a comment off camera. And if you didn't hear him, what he said was this, is that the, one of the reasons why these generations looked older is because experientially they were older. Um, because they were marrying younger. Uh, they were taking on responsibility earlier, often joining the armed forces, often already holding jobs, often contributing to the family, um, actually. You know, my, my uncle, uh, who's uh, well into his 80s, was recently telling me about how when he was, um, you know, he was in middle school, you know, he was mowing grass and this kind of thing, stuff that I did. But then when he was in high school, he worked in the local mill. He would get at the mill at 6 a.m., work until 9 a.m., and then go to school until 3 and get out and uh, and work at the mill or maybe do a paper route or something like that. And some of his money was going to the family. And that was because the whole family was expected to contribute in order to keep the family afloat, to buy food, to pay the bills, to do these kinds of things. Uh, that has changed uh, in a, in a uh, big way, changed probably primarily with my generation. My generation didn't do that. We didn't we didn't contribute to um, uh, to the family bills. Anything we earned, we could just simply, you know, spend on ourselves in whatever way we wanted to. And same with um, with millennials and uh, and Gen Zers. Um, but I think it taught those generations a certain kind of responsibility. It also gave them a confidence. I will tell you this. You know, um, those students. I've seen so many, you know, when I was teaching college and at a preparatory school, those young men who went off to the military, I cannot, I, I couldn't even begin to name the number of students that I knew that were kind of slovenly, uh, somewhat maybe, you know, disrespectful, directionless, but joined the military. And when you saw them again, particularly if they were in uniform, they carried them, so they had a bounce in their step. They had a confidence because they had been tested as young men and it gave them confidence. They had been disciplined. They came back speaking more respectful. I don't know, again, if this would be the truth, uh, true today, but it was certainly true, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, you would see this among the generation that I mostly taught the generation that is now millennials. And I would see a lot of these kids coming back um, very different because the military life had changed them. And, and I will tell you that, um, you know, you're, you, to Zachary's comment, those, it's an excellent comment because taking on early responsibility and marrying young did make a difference. Lori and I married at 19. We married at 19. Um, that was fairly common. Um, that has now changed, and the result of that is that you have infertility issues, you have massive infertility issues because um, women marrying much later because the culture tells them to do that. Um, you also have people who arrive you know, at the altar with uh, long and sordid sexual histories because they have a desire, they have keen uh, sexual desire, a drive, but they've not been told what is the proper outlet for that, and that is within within marriage. So the result of that is that that they end up doing things that they regret. You know, ours is a God of grace. Uh, he is a God of um, of forgiveness. Uh, but again, I think a lot of these problems might have been avoided had this uh, not been the case. So, uh, and then what he's talking about here, this permanent adolescence and and androgyny. So true of where we find ourselves today. Another comment, you're on the losing side of history. Well, <laughs> uh, okay. So here's somebody who believes that I have chosen, I have chosen poorly. 
Uh, I will refute that and say that no, I haven't, because I believe that history is moving irresistibly from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22. And I believe that that if you get nothing else about the book of Revelation, some of you would be interested in reading it, some of you wouldn't. Some of you would maintain that you understand in toto what it says and means. Um, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't have any such illusions. But I do know that Revelation is telling us this, we win. We win. If you get nothing else out of Revelation, we win. One day Jesus will walk on the stage of history, as C.S. Lewis put it, and he will, and the play will be over. And when he does, uh, it will be such a moment of um, splendor, such a moment of joy for those who have believed in him and trusted him. And it will be a moment of utter terror for those who have not. So I don't believe that I'm on the wrong side of history. You said that you're going to the World Economic Forum. How does someone like you even get in? Better wear a Kevlar vest. <laughs> well, um, I don't actually get in. I go to where the World Economic Forum is being held, and that is in Davos, Switzerland. And um, listen, it costs, I don't know what, what it costs um, this, this year, uh, January of 2024, um, but last year it was twenty five to about $50,000 to attend the sessions. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna waste the uh, the money of donors uh, on something something like that. Rather, it is my experience, and of course, I was at the World Economic Forum in January of 2023, so I know this to be true. The most interesting things that happen in almost any conference. It doesn't matter if it's a, a gathering like this of megalomaniacs or if it's the you know the Lawnmowers Association of America. It doesn't matter. The most interesting things happen where. Yes, it's, uh, what, it's what happens around the bar. It's what happens in the hotel lobbies and the coffee shops. What's that? Always in, between. Always in between sessions because you're going to get, they're going to be pretty careful about what they say in the plenary sessions. 70% of the World Economic Forum's presentations are online. You can watch it at home. And they, for the most part, are pretty careful in those sessions because they do know that. But if you really want to interact with the rank and file of the WEF, as they call it, just hang out in the lobbies, just hang out in the hotels, just, just hang out at the coffee shops, the restaurants, and just be a fly on the wall. And it is amazing what you will hear. And it is because that is where the real conversations take place. So that's what I'll do. Stay tuned. There's more of that that will, that will come. I love... The Ideas Have Consequences podcast. The way you teach and explain things makes so much sense to me. Thank you. You're welcome. Trump is our only hope. I see this, this kind of nonsense all the time on social media and on YouTube. Um, some of you are going, what? You're against Trump? You think that's nonsense? No, I'm not against Trump. I voted for Trump. And will again if he's the nominee. However, Trump isn't my only hope. My, I mean, when you say things like this, what if, what if Trump has a heart attack and died? Does that mean that your hope dies? You have no hope? Zero hope? Is that what that means? My hope is not in any political candidate or government. So no, uh, my hope is not in Trump. I mean, I wonder how many Israelites their hope had been put in Moses. Then the Lord took him and he raised up Joshua. I mean, the Lord can do this. Jesus ascended into heaven and the disciples who seemed absolutely rudderless, suddenly a Peter stepped forward and he led. So no, my hope is not in Donald Trump, though I do hope that he wins or someone of... Um, you know, of real strength and who is a genuine conservative can win. And by the way, this gives me an opportunity to say something that I've thought many times. The MAGA attacks on DeSantis make no sense at all. I get it that he's seen as an opponent and a rival, and therefore there have to be mutual, you know, barbs at one another. But there are efforts by some to 
utterly destroy DeSantis. And the result of that is you're going to lose Florida. You're going to make it so the guy can't even get reelected in his own state. And he's been a great governor. He has been absolutely a great governor of Florida. The last thing we need is for Florida to turn blue. We do not want to see a Democrat um, as governor of the state of Florida. And the way conservatives, Trump supporting conservatives, are mauling DeSantis, it could lead to that. It could lead to that. What is your opinion on Christian nationalism? It's not even a conversation I want to weigh in on, in part because I feel that it is such a distraction um, on social media. It's like occasionally I go to that corner of Twitter and I see people over there arguing uh, this kind of stuff and uh, missing the larger cultural conversation. Um, I, I will say this, that the Christian faith, if it is to be taken seriously, it is to be taken seriously in every aspect of life, and that includes politics. So the mentality that some have, <laughs> interestingly enough, the Christianity Today crowd that we were just talking about falls into this category. They will say that you shouldn't be political. Russell Moore, the Christianity Today in the center of that picture, he is the most political, 100%, extremely political. But they're the sorts that will say to you, ah, Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. They are in politics. Guys like him are very much involved in politics. And listen, as a Christian, I believe that the Bible has something relevant to say about every aspect of life, uh, not just simply that aspect of our life, which is private, but the public aspects of our faith, how we vote, how we think about candidates, and, um, and how we process various issues. Also, we live in a constitutional republic. We do have the right to vote. We should use it. So I think the Christian faith, if it's a vibrant Christian faith, it changes a culture. As I say you know, in my book, The Grace Effect, what I mean by the grace effect is as we are transformed inwardly by God's grace, we begin to exhibit it outwardly. And thus, we're transformed inwardly and the culture itself is transformed. This is a historical argument that I, I think I can make with some measure of credibility that those countries that have been most touched by the gospel have been those countries where their laws have tended to be, not throughout, but as compared to the rest of the world, touched by grace. And so is their art, so is their literature, so is the culture as a whole. There's a reason why that America has been the most generous country on earth. It's irrefutable. The data is absolutely there to support that, and that is due to a vibrant Christian faith, though one that is leaking from the culture like a slow leak in a tire. Parents need to take back the lead on disciplining their children. They are the primary educators, not the church, not the school. This is the main reason we see so many youth leaving the church even before graduating high school. No more outsourcing, discipleship, and education. Amen. This was a YouTuber who made this particular comment, amen. Don't outsource the parenting of your children, not to the youth pastor, certainly not to the public school or even a private one. You need to be the most influential person in your child's life, and you need to know what's going on in their lives. Your show is being suppressed by YouTube. We are very aware of this. <laughs> they are choking us, but stay tuned because we will soon launch a new um, network on a new platform, and we're pretty excited about that. It's going to—we've got a little ways to go, but um, but that's coming. So pay attention to that. What topics do you plan to address in the new year? Well, obviously, soon I will be going to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. So that's that's going to be a topic that I'm going to address. But here's a fun one. I'm going to do a series on conspiracy theories. A series on conspiracy theories. Not, not old conspiracy theories like who shot JFK and you know, did Winston Churchill actually know about um, you know, Pearl Harbor? Did, did the United States know about Pearl Harbor? But modern conspiracy theories, recent 
conspiracy theories, things like January 6th and the 2020 election and, um, you know, vaccines and, you know, is Trudeau, this is a fun one, is Trudeau actually the son of Castro? I'm going to delve into that. And that's that I'm going to delve into the ones where there's a measure of credibility to support the conspiracy theory. And at the end of the podcast, we will arrive at a place of whether or not, you know, I believe it. Do I say, hey, this conspiracy theory actually has validity. It is true. It's not a conspiracy theory. It is, it is true. Or whether or not it's just nonsense. It's just meant to distract you. So I'm going to do a whole series on conspiracy theories. Feel free to say in the comments uh, or, uh, you know, on, on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Larry Taunton. Uh, send your ideas of things that you'd like to see me address. Doesn't, doesn't mean that I will address them, but I will at least um, think about that. So there are a few topics that I plan to address in order to bring some clarity to these things. Uh, another comment, Larry, I finished your Hitchens book last night. It was extremely well done. I found it intellectually and spiritually provocative and educational. What is my next read? I hope... 24 brings you health and fulfillment. Please keep publishing. It is interesting to see such depth of faith accompanied by such a keen intellect. My mind and spirit are definitely expanding. I may have to start hanging out at foreign airports to meet more interesting people. This was a, this is actually um, from a man, you know, I was talking about engaging people and the importance of engaging people. I am fairly outgoing, uh, gregarious. And, um, and so I chat with people. If I'm standing in line for a long time, I might you know, strike up a conversation with someone. I might have a conversation with the waiter or the waitress or the, you know, the flight attendant, this kind of thing. And on this particular occasion, I was waiting at the airport with my wife, sat down in, a, um, in, in one of the few seats. Airports these days have virtually nowhere to sit, but I managed to, to find a place to sit. And it was next to this this gentleman and we engaged in uh, in conversation. And upon finding out that I was a writer, he wrote down uh, the name of one of my books and read it, and then sent me this email, which is very kind of him um, to to send that. So I'm delighted to hear that he enjoyed that. I love the podcast with Sasha. Very powerful. Yes, listening to Sasha tell her story uh, is indeed very powerful. Another comment, and by the way, I get this one a lot. I won't listen to anyone who wrote for CNN and The Atlantic. Now, this is a reference to me. It's a reference to my own bio where I say that I wrote for CNN. Uh, I did some television for CNN. I wasn't employed by them. I just did was kind of a token conservative who would come on from time to time, as I did with Fox News and Al Jazeera and you know BBC and this kind of thing. So I've written for just about everybody. But... To those of you who make these kind of comments, you're not members of the posse, um, obviously, because if you were, you would be familiar with my commentary and you'd be familiar with my writing, which you would know is not hardly left-leaning. But it also shows me how short-sighted you are. Ladies and gentlemen, I love getting in front of the unconverted. Now, in that sense, I'm probably pretty unique um, among conservative writers and commentators. I would love to write for The Atlantic and do NPR all day. I would love to be that conservative voice in those venues. I used to have those opportunities as they have um, purged themselves of um, reasonable editors and producers. It's almost impossible anymore. I uh, On Christmas Eve, for instance, I uh, posted on Twitter an article that I wrote called From Bedford Falls to Pottersville, an article that went viral for CNN that I published with them, I think in 2011. And that piece went crazy viral, in which I was saying in the article, I was saying that I was using the Christmas movie, which pretty much everybody knows. I was saying that George Bailey, who discovered what the world would be like without him. He, he, he had lived in, in Bedford Falls, which was a sweet, small town. And when the angel allowed him to see what the world would look like without him, it was, it was Pottersville. It was this rough town. It was strip joints and liquor stores and, you know, dancing girls and all this kind of stuff. And, um, 
even some of the people that he knew, their lives were utterly changed. They weren't good people. And the angel's giving him a glimpse of what his gentle, honest presence had done to that town. Well, my argument was that, that that really is a fitting metaphor for what a culture looks like absent Christian belief. When you take the George Baileys, the Christians out of the culture, you end up with Pottersville. America is rapidly becoming Pottersville. That's the direction that we are going. And it is because the George Baileys are becoming fewer and fewer. Well, CNN would never publish that piece now. They did publish it in 2011, but they would never publish that piece now. And um, the point being, I want to get in front of the unconverted. I've always been happy speaking to um, leftist groups. I'm always happy to speak to atheist groups and so on. It doesn't bother me at all. It doesn't intimidate me in the least. Recently, I was uninvited. I was supposed to speak to a Jewish book club in Palm Beach. And I was uninvited because an academic in the crowd in their, among their members had complained that I was coming to speak. He didn't want me to speak. He did everything he could to block it, and he did. Now, this is what's interesting. As I proposed, I said, bring him up on stage. I'll be happy to talk to him too. If, he, if he, he would like to debate with me, I'll be happy to have a conversation with him about my book, which was what I was there to discuss. Somebody in that group had read it and liked it and wanted me to come and, uh, and, and discuss the book and to do a Q&A with them. He sought to shut it down, and that's because they do not have confidence in their worldview. They do not believe that their worldview can stand up to any meaningful scrutiny. That's why they do that. And again, he's an academic at a university, which is supposed to be about ideas. But he's afraid. He's afraid. There's, a, there's a, a term I want to use for guys like that, but I won't use it here. But maybe you can guess what that, what that term is. Well said, Larry. I have learned a lot from you, and I love your show, Ideas Have Consequences. I talk about you and your show so much that my boyfriend started getting jealous and asked me, now who is this Larry guy? <laughs> SMH. What's that? Shake my head. Shake my head. Uh, I said, really, laugh out loud, too dang funny, but keep up the good work and God bless a member of the posse. Well, first of all, let him know that he has absolutely nothing to worry about and tell him that he should join the posse and thank you both. I attended one of your coffee shop discussions years ago, started me on a journey to faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you. You know, that excites me. Again, I have always enjoyed having those interactions with smaller groups. Given a choice uh, to speak to a thousand or speak to 30, I'd prefer to sit and have a meaningful conversation with the 30. And I used to do uh, locally, well, I've also done them abroad. I've done them in Europe. I've done them in Australia. I've done them, well, I've done them all over the U.S., I guess. So never mind. I guess it's not just, just locally. But I uh, have done a lot of these coffee to shop conversations where we just simply advertise that I'll be speaking on a particular topic. People pile into the place, they grab a cup of coffee, they sit down, and then uh, I give a presentation and take questions. And that's been a very highly successful format for us. I don't feel obligated to answer every question. And the reason is because I don't know all the answers to every question. I'm very comfortable in saying, I don't know. It was great advice given to me by uh, the late, a great historian, uh, Pulitzer Prize nominee, and a uh, mentor of mine who guided my thesis, Forrest McDonald, before I took my, my oral examinations, which, um, you know, five academics pounding away at you for three hours. He said, if you don't know the answer, say, I don't know because they will know that you don't know. <laughs> so uh, I don't mind saying I don't know. Um, you know, he who, he who would defend all defends nothing is what um, Frederick the Great said. So essential minds focus on the essentials, and that's what I seek to do. But another reason is because sometimes, sometimes questioners want to get you off topic. They're just simply trolling you, and I'm, I'm not going to play that game, but I am interested in talking to people who are seeking. And there are a lot of people who are seeking in our culture now. Jesus said, look, the fields 
are white, ready for harvest. And indeed, they are. They are. They were then and they are now. Another comment. The thing I like most about you is that you are real. Um, I take that as a compliment. I think it's intended uh, as a compliment. Um, I hope so. I don't, I don't want to present a, uh, I don't want to be pretentious. I don't want to pre um, present something that I'm not. Um, so I, uh, I hope that I'm real. And final comment, I hate it. And that is from Richard Dawkins. That is a comment from Richard Dawkins in response to an article I wrote about him. I hate it. I made sure to include that comment in the, the published version of the article about him. This is what follows as an article about Richard Dawkins. I talked to him about the article. I let him read the article, and his response was, I hate it. I'm sure he would feel the same way about this particular show, but maybe not. I've had some very interesting interactions with uh, Professor Dawkins over the years. And I want to end with this. I see so many people these days who are just down in the dumps. I mean, so many conservatives, so many Christians, uh, so many people who love this country. They're just down in the dumps. Ladies and gentlemen, media is meant to, as I said in a little Christmas video, it is meant to keep you in a constant state of anxiety, a constant state of fear. It's meant to do that, and it's meant to make you feel outnumbered. You are not outnumbered. I believe the sensible people in this country outnumber the idiots in this country. You know, it's interesting. One of the comments that we addressed here, this woman said that the, the uh, radical feminist movement started with a small group of women. Uh, Lenin, Vladimir Lenin, when he took over the Bolshevik party, what he did was he purged it of everybody who wasn't absolutely sold out to his radical uh, communist ideology. He didn't want a big tent party. He wanted a small, dedicated group. Now, Bolshevik means majority party. The Mensheviks, uh, he means, you know, his opposition means uh, uh, minority party, but that was a that was propaganda. That was a lie. The fact is the Bolsheviks were by far the smaller party. But he wanted a dedicated group for the overthrow of the regime and the existing social order. That is what we are seeing now. It is a small, radicalized group, but they're getting bigger by the day. And they're getting bigger by the day because they have the, the reins of control of almost every um major political and cultural institution, whether it's major media, whether it's big tech, whether it is uh, um, uh, secondary education, or it is the university system, entertainment, they're in control of almost all of these things. But I do believe that the majority of Americans that generally reside in red states, they're the more sensible people and they're the larger group. They're the majority party here. But you need to find your voice. You need to find your courage. You need to be willing to do some of the things that we just laid out in this particular episode. Are you willing to mentor some young people? Are you willing to engage someone in conversation as you're standing in line, as you're waiting at the airport, uh, engaging with people at your own church? You have to be willing to engage people and you have to be willing to be bruised. You don't have to have a big platform. You don't have to do what I do, but can you just have small conversations with people and be willing to take a stand um, for the voiceless, um, for the defenseless, for the oppressed? Are you willing to do those things? And why am I hopeful? I am hopeful because I serve a great God. And because if he could change the world with 12, and he did, I dare say that he can change it with the millions who have watched just this show, to say nothing of the many other conservative and thoughtful shows that there are out there. So I hope that you'll buck up, take courage, and engage the world. This has been Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton.